Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy and gratefulness, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 21st in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I want to talk to you about a text this morning, and this topic is so misunderstood. And so it is my hope to thoroughly explain what it is I want to express to you, but I am sure that I will miss many key areas that I should speak upon. Now, much of the misunderstanding and the confusion has come from, and let me be gentle in saying this, but much of the confusion and misunderstanding has come from the Pentecostal movement and more lately, the charismatic movement. Now, you must understand in 2,000 years of New Testament biblical history, the Pentecostal movement and the teachings that go along with it, as well as the charismatic movement, are only a little over a hundred years old. And so what we understand from that is for the first 1900 years of the Christian movement, these beliefs were not held by anyone. Now you say, pastor, what beliefs are you talking about? I'm speaking of the gifts in the idea that all the emphasis is placed upon the gifts. I mean, think about it for a moment. Out of the thousands and thousands of people that came to know the Lord Jesus during the time of the apostles, if you will read the book of Acts, you will see that there is no mention of any of these followers doing miraculous works. It seems that these miraculous works were being performed and were exclusive to the apostles of Jesus those who had been sent by Jesus himself. And this, of course, would be the 11 disciples, possibly Matthias, who was chosen to take Judas's place. And then later on, we know that it was Paul because Paul was caught up into the third heaven and he received instruction from the Lord Jesus himself. So he was a latter apostle. Now, I say all of this because I want your focus and your understanding to be on the inner work of the Holy Spirit in the deepest parts of your heart, refining every attitude, every emotion, every feeling, every thought, and not so much on the outward expression of running, jumping, hollering, goosebumps, and the like. You see, if we take that approach, we fall into what Jesus said about the Pharisees. The emphasis is on the outside of the cup rather than on the inside of the cup. Jesus said the error comes not in the fact that you actually commit the act of, let's say, adultery, but the error is in the very fact that it would be in your heart that you would desire it to begin with. So the work, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to refine us from the inside out. Now, before I get ahead of myself, let me address the text that I would like to share with you this morning, because I want you to understand that at the moment of salvation, we receive the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. But there is a further blessing that God wants to bestow upon us, and it's the fullness of his spirit. And this isn't manifested by an outward expression so much, but it's expressed through an inward empowerment that changes us and causes us to be radical, sold out, on fire for Jesus, followers of Jesus. Well, as I said, before I get ahead of myself, let's look at our text. Turn to Acts chapter 20, and let's begin at verse 17. 
Now, Paul is in the middle of his missionary journey. He at one time imprisoned and killed Christians. He met the Lord Jesus in a radical experience on the way to Damascus to capture some Christians. And from that moment of his radical experience, he was never again the same. Something happened. And this is where we pick up in verse 17. It says, Paul was traveling from Miletus and he sent to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church. And it says in verse 18, when they were come to him, he said unto them, you know, brothers, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, I have served the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations those that befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. You see, every time Paul arrived in a new city, the Jews were following him. They were creating havoc and chaos, trying to sidetrack the work that, that Paul was doing for the Lord Jesus. And Paul says in verse 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and I have taught you publicly from house to house. Now remember, at this time in history, there weren't churches like we know them today. They were house churches. And each of these house churches had elders appointed unto them, and that's who Paul is speaking to. He says, I have testified to the Jews and to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul has distinguished between two factors that are significant and take place in the Christian's life. He says there is repentance toward God and there is faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. To better understand this, turn back to Acts chapter 19 and let's begin at verse 1. It says, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And this is where these house churches that we just spoke about in chapter 20 actually were initiated in this work that Paul was doing. Well, while in Ephesus, he found certain disciples of the Lord Jesus. And notice this. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Now, these are believers. The Bible even says that they are disciples. They are loyal followers of the Lord Jesus. But Paul wants to know if they've received the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And they said unto Paul, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And so Paul, confused, said unto them, well, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Notice that. John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So the purpose of John's baptism is that we would recognize our sin and we would repent of our sin. Well, let's continue. He said unto the people that they should believe on him which should come on after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Well, when they heard this, they then were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had been baptized in John unto the repentance of sins. Now they are baptized in the Lord Jesus. Well, what is the baptism of the Lord Jesus? It's the full absorption of our sins. It's when our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. When we are born again, God takes our old hearts out and gives us new hearts with new desires, new longings, new pursuits, and new passions. But then notice in verse 6, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. In other words, there was something different about them than there was just a few moments ago. And the emphasis, as we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
is on the prophesying, speaking boldly the word of God. That's what prophesying means. And Paul says, put more emphasis on the prophesying than the speaking of tongues. And yet today, so many place emphasis on the speaking of tongues. Well, we see the same thing if we flip back to Acts chapter 8 and we look at verse 9. It says, there was a certain man called Simon. He had before time in the same city that Philip was in prophesying, proclaiming the word of God. Simon had been a sorcerer and he was bewitching the people of Samaria, persuading the people to believe that he was some great one. And because of the things that he did through his sorcery, they all gave heed unto him. They looked unto him as a great one. But when they heard Philip prophesying the word of God, proclaiming the word of God, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon the sorcerer believed in the message of Philip, believed in the work of Jesus. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and he wondered as he beheld the miracles and signs which were being done by Philip. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down, prayed for the people of Samaria, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet, he was fallen upon none of them. Only, notice this, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now here's what I want you to take from this this morning, friends. And here's what I want to try to express to you in the best way that I can. We can see from these passages that it is possible to be deeply zealous in our service unto the Lord Jesus and yet not have received the fullness of his spirit. It is possible to desire the things of God, to commit ourselves to his work, and yet all the while not be fully empowered by his Holy Spirit. So the question that we must ask is what is the difference in the three baptisms? We've read about the baptism of John. We've read about the baptism of Jesus. And now we've read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So these would be three different experiences that we have in the Lord. Now, let me be the first to say, there are some that receive all three baptisms in the same moment of their salvation experience. And then there are others throughout the sanctifying process receive these baptisms as we read in these stories at different times. Now, it would appear to us, Paul, for instance, on the road to Damascus, received all three baptisms at once. But there are others such as these that we've just read about, specifically in Ephesus and Samaria, who became followers of the Lord Jesus and at a latter time received the full power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now we know the indication of the Holy Spirit in our lives is noted in Galatians chapter 5 when it speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, the things that the Spirit produces in our lives. But I think we can simply define it as this. John's baptism is a baptism unto repentance. Jesus's baptism is a baptism unto forgiveness. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of empowerment. You see, the baptism in Jesus gives us forgiveness of sin. The baptism in the Holy Spirit gives us victory over sin, where our lives truly become a mirror representation of Romans chapter 6. We are dead to sin, to live no longer therein. What once was a problem for us to overcome now comes so easily because the Holy Spirit has filled us to the very limits of what we can receive 
in order to give us power and victory over sin. And that's why it says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God, or we could say the fullness of the spirit is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness. This word, this is an inward empowerment where now we live righteously before God in all areas of our lives in everything we think, in everything we say, in everything that we do. It's also peace. It's the very confidence that we have in the Lord whom we serve, and we no longer stand in our own power, our own strength, but we have crucified ourselves, and we stand alone in God and his work. And this brings peace to us. But then notice, after it says it's righteousness and peace, it's joy in the Holy Ghost. And why is it joy? Because we are walking in the full experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this isn't something that we learn. It's not a process. It is an instantaneous experience that happens to us and changes us forever, just like salvation was or the baptism in Jesus. And I wanted to bring this study to you this morning because I know that there are many of you who deeply love the Lord Jesus and you have been baptized in the Lord Jesus. You have received forgiveness of sin, but you know in the depth of your heart, you're missing something when it comes to the righteousness of God, the peace of God and the joy of God. And if that is true of you, friend, then what you're missing is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is the experience that Paul speaks of when he says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It transcends anything that this world has to offer, and there's nothing that this world can do to take it from us. Once we receive it, we are forever changed, and we are different from those around us because something radical has taken place. And because it's unspeakable and full of glory, it's impossible to define. You won't understand it until you receive it yourself. You will only know deep in your heart that you are missing something. And for many, if not most, this is the ingredient of the Christian life they are missing. You may be missing. And that's why everything you do unto the Lord seems to be with so much effort. Yet when you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's effortless. Everything is so natural. It happens so naturally slash supernaturally because now you are truly no longer the same person that you were before. Something supernatural, something miraculous, something heavenly has taken place in your life and it will affect everything in you and everything around you. And it's not represented by outward manifestations, but it's represented by an explosion of heavenly joy in your spirit. And it beams from your life as if you had swallowed the sun itself. How could you contain that light? It would beam from every pore of your person. And so it is with the joy of Jesus, the love of Jesus. And that's why John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming who will baptize you with fire. He will ignite your soul from the inside out and everything about you will be different. Now I must end this time together this morning, friend, by simply saying there's no secret to receiving this. There's no recipe that I can give you that if you would do A, B, and C, D will follow. All I can encourage you to do that if you know 
You are not experiencing this life-changing joy, joy that exceeds all the circumstances of this world, that exceeds anything this world has to offer. Friend, simply ask the Father. Seek Him diligently, and He will reward you bountifully. For notice what it says in Luke chapter 11, and beginning at verse 5. Jesus says, which of you has a friend will go unto him at midnight and say, friend, please give me bread. And in verse seven, after you asking your friend this from within, he will say, trouble me not. The door is shut. My children are in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Jesus says in verse eight, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, but because of his importunity, his shamelessness of beating on the door and begging bread, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. Well, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. Well, what is Jesus speaking about? Look at verse 13. How can you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children? How much more shall your heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to them that ask him. You see, the purpose of the Spirit is so that we can walk in victory. And when we walk in victory, we experience the full joy of the Lord. Knowing that we are no longer like the rest of the world, but we are chosen of God, gifted by Him, and we walk a step above the rest of the world around us. And that's why the Bible says The same resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave is the same power that resides within you and enables you to walk as victoriously as Jesus himself walked when he was on planet earth. Oh friend, only you know your heart. Only you know your life. Only you know the things that you're struggling with. But if you're missing what this is, that the Bible has been speaking to us about this morning, seek the Father diligently, and he will reward you bountifully. Well, I hope that your eyes have been opened to this truth this morning. I hope that you understand the differentiation in what the Bible is trying to teach us, and that there are so many among us who have received the baptism of John, who have received the baptism of the Lord Jesus. But as for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they know not whatsoever it is that we speak of. Oh friend, it is my prayer that you will experience this for yourself and that you will then begin to walk in the full victory of the Lord Jesus as he has so purposed you to do. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.